and they're looking good. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Seth Cropsey, Senior Fellow here and Director of Hudson Institute's Center for American Sea Power. Um, the discussion today will be with uh, former Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman. Am I, can I be heard? Good, okay. Uh, um, and just a, a couple of notes. Uh, after the question period, uh, John will be available to sign books which are for sale, and it's a cash bar only. So for $20 a pop, you can't get a much better deal. <laughs> um, Secretary Lehman earned his bachelor's degree from St. Joseph's University. Uh, his both his uh, a bachelor's degree and master's degree uh, from uh, what's it say Cambridge? Yes, I was going to say that other place, but yes, Cambridge. And uh, his doctorate from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he served on Henry Kissinger's staff at the White House and also as a naval aviator um, with an excellent reputation in the fleet and then uh, Secretary of the Navy in the Reagan administration. Uh, he founded the John F. Lehman Company in the mid-1980s, where he is chairman. And he also serve, he serves on innumerable boards, uh, is the author of five books, the most recent of which is the subject of our discussion today, um, and was also a member of the 9-11 Commission. Um, John's book is about the contribution of naval forces to the positive conclusion to our competition with the Soviets. His argument favors an active rather than a passive maritime strategy, and the outcome suggests that he is correct. And I think I'll sit down. Um, uh, so I'll ask some questions, and we we can both sit down here. And, uh, uh, I get nervous. Uh, I need to walk around. All right, fine. Uh, you can okay. sit. <laughs> and by the way, as you, some of you heard me say before, with a, such a short introduction, after my mother wrote that long uh, piece, it's very disappointing. Uh, and, and it's a. Uh, uh, Peter has heard this story many times, but uh, uh, when I first started to work for Henry Kissinger, I had the, 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 I was pressed into service to introduce him to a local world affairs group that was visiting the White House. And I said, now here is a man, Henry Kissinger, national security advisor, a man who needs no introduction. And so he gave a great speech and afterwards he he took me aside very angry and he said, Lehman, don't you ever do that again. Don't you realize that those of us who are introduced as needing no introduction are the ones who crave it the most? <laughs> so would you like to continue? <laughs> It's, uh, it's an honor to be introduced by uh, one of the naval experts and uh, authors uh, who uh, uh, is, uh, I think his, his book, uh, See Blindness, will be a, a classic. So uh, uh, people ask me wh why I wrote the book. And the reason is because nobody else was writing the book. And uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great story. It's a, a great lesson in, uh, in, in national security uh, politics. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, uh, I conned uh, Peter Schwartz here into uh, uh, helping me uh, uh, put, pull together. We knew the story. The story tells itself almost. but. We had to get a lot of stuff declassified. And uh, since the common wisdom in academia and in, uh, in the media is 
essentially the Cold War ended because of uh, Gorbachev and because of the inevitability of uh, uh, the inefficiency of the Soviets and so forth. And so certainly Ronald Reagan, the cowboy, had nothing to do with it. And uh, uh, the US Navy had nothing to do with it. And so we had to balance the, the requirements of really telling a really good story and not boring people with a lot of footnotes and so forth. But on the other hand, seeing that we had real factual backup uh, that was uh, uh, available that could be researched by scholars uh, to back up everything we said about it. So uh, I think uh, I think we're pretty happy, Peter, uh, with uh, uh, what we were able to uh, strike in that balance. It's a good story, good read. And the lessons, as we you know, the cliche, what is now a cliche that history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes often. And history is rhyming today with uh, with the seventies, and uh, and I think uh, there are real lessons to be drawn for the current and uh, uh, immediate challenges that uh, the the free world of the West faces. So I hope we can get into those in questions. Uh, I mean, there are so many people uh, here that I see that uh, uh, they know a lot about this subject, so I won't, uh, I won't belabor the storyline. Uh, and uh, also, I want you to buy the book, so I'm not going to tell you all the really cool things in there. But uh, it's a great story. It starts really because um, NATO, uh, a after, particularly after uh, Watergate and uh, the end of the Vietnam War, had kind of fallen into a, a, a defeatism that was really born of the evolution of the post-war balance. NATO, as, as it was constituted, was inherently a European-centered uh, alliance. And the way it was staffed meant the staffing was between four and five to one of Army and Air Force personnel from the member nations and naval person, one naval person, five to one, four to one. So the, the dominant strategic view was clearly focused, centered almost exclusively on uh, the Folder Gap, the North German Plain. Navies were seen as uh, kind of truck drivers to keep the Atlantic Bridge open. Um, and, uh, uh, and that was essentially it. But there was a deeper flaw in the, in the uh, strategy of NATO as it evolved into the 60s and 70s. And that was that with 180 active divisions in the Warsaw Pact aligned along uh, the, the uh, what we called the FIBA, the forward edge of the battle area, uh, the Fulda Gap, the North German Plain, and so forth, compared to a max of about 40 divisions that, that NATO ever was uh, willing to, to mobilize meant that there was a huge imbalance in the land uh, tactical conventional uh, military balance, which was met by NATO adopting flexible response. Well, we couldn't match them in conventional forces, but uh, the theoreticians came up with the, the concept that uh, we can counter their conventional uh, advantages if they launch any attack against NATO by using tactical nuclear weapons. And not, not just battlefield weapons, but tactical nuclear weapons, IRBMs, and uh, uh, nuclear weapons that could uh, strike the rear areas, and uh, uh, that would, that would uh, uh, blunt any conventional advantage that, uh, that they, they had. Uh, of course, this was kind of nonsensical. It was uh, 
it, 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 the Soviets never believed it. There was never any evidence that they felt the tact, uh, there was any difference between tactical and strategic, and quite understandably, because a lot of the IRBMs would land on Western Soviet uh, uh, geography, and they did not believe there was any such thing as a fire break between tactical and strategic. And they further believed that they could, and, and pretty much the war gaming in NATO and shape uh, reflected this, that the real issue was would it take the Warsaw Pact one week, two weeks, three weeks? The optimists thought maybe four weeks to get to the English Channel. And in the meantime, that would, uh, there would be, the decision would be made uh, by uh, NATO to go nuclear. Well, the Soviets did not believe that. They believed that uh, being quite uh, uh, involved in their intelligence in what uh, the politics in each of the key democracies in NATO was, they did not believe that any of the, the European uh, democracies would ever, including the United States, uh, be able politically to make the decision to go nuclear uh, first. And so that gave them a, a, a self-confidence and a, that really was resulted in the bluster that we all uh, uh, remember from uh, the late 60s and 70s uh, with uh, the declaration of the Brezhnev Doctrine that they had the right to go into any any uh, 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 any nation uh, that uh, was uh, uh, attacking or undermining or or um, uh, uh, interfering with uh, the growth of communism, <clears throat> and uh, um, that's a period when they felt free to really start getting heavily involved in in Latin America and, uh, uh, and in Africa and supporting national liberation movements uh, uh, around the world. And NATO's response was really quite daunting in that it was, well, you know, really we've got to negotiate because uh, they have this tremendous uh, conventional uh, advantage. And, uh, and that was the period of detente where, where that was the, the answer of the West to uh, the growing Soviet uh, uh, use of the, the shadow of their military advantage. And the irony was, and this is something that was really growing in a large body of the intellectual community of realpolitik, of the realists, people like strauss and Pei and uh, Sam Huntington and uh, uh, and Henry Kissinger. Uh, that wait a minute. Uh, let's step back. Does anybody have a map? Uh, here is NATO uh, with the uh, uh, essentially the traditional command of the seas. Warsaw Pact is a, a land central uh, landlocked. Uh, alliance with uh, almost no warm water ports, most of their land above, most of their geography above the 50th parallel, which is lousy agricultural land. And through the Cold War, uh, we, uh, uh, the West, primarily the United States, supplied 85% of the food uh, to the Soviet Union. And yet we were, we felt we had to make concessions totally ignored was the use of naval power as a balancer to, to the Soviet advantage in conventional land power. <clears throat> Quite the opposite, culminating uh, uh, during the Carter administration, that uh, it was felt that there was, it was a waste of money to spend any more uh, 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 of scarce budgetary resources to uh, uh, modernize offensive power in the navies. Uh, it should be shifted to buy more tanks and more uh, infantry divisions to the extent that was possible. And uh, the Navy should just stick to what it does uh, 
which is uh, carry supplies across the North Atlantic. And out of this came this notional idea of a Maginot Line uh, between the uh, Greenland, Iceland, United <coughs> Kingdom, and, uh, and, uh, and the continent, where we would uh, prevent them by having uh, our forces below that uh, interfering with their subs and uh, surface forces coming down to interdict the Atlantic Sea Bridge. That was where that became the naval uh, strategy. And uh, of course, it was, uh, it was an irrational strategy by, if judged by the realities of, uh, of the physics and geography of, of, uh, of that area. Uh, but nevertheless, the NATO navies were forbidden to go north of the GIUK gap for 20 years. Uh, the certainly naval forces went up there, but they were not allowed to hold major exercises and, uh, uh, and to bring offensive uh, uh, forces in mass up there. Every year there was a, a big NATO naval exercise by various names where uh, they practiced uh, uh, operating together and underway replenishment and uh, and, and these were very large exercises all the way from uh, uh, the east coast of the United States uh, to the Eastern Med. So when, uh, when this uh, skepticism over naval, uh, NATO strategy grew to a point where it began to become a major political uh, debate uh, to jump over a lot of, of uh, unnecessary detail, uh, both George Bush and and Ronald Reagan, in their uh, uh, in their primary battles, emphasized rebuilding the navy and building a 600 ship navy and uh, uh, and 15 carriers, offensive uh, equipped carriers, and more submarines and so forth. And uh, this is what uh, both of them campaigned on. And if you read the Republican platform. Uh, it, it is specifically built around the 600 ship Navy and restoring uh, unapologetically uh, maritime supremacy, a word that had been banned. Navy was not even allowed to say that word in official speeches or, or testimony. <clears throat> so, but this, is, this was not a Republican uh, movement. It was really truly bipartisan. There were as many uh, uh, democratic advocates of this uh, shift in policy, like uh, Scoop Jackson and John Stennis and, and many others, uh, as there were Republicans, because there were Republicans had a lot of, of uh, non-navalist, let us say, uh, leaders, and people like Clifford Case and so forth, that. Uh, uh, so it was really a bipartisan movement, and, and uh, uh, it, it had been put together jointly, really uh, up on Capitol Hill uh, in the, the two years preceding, uh, preceding the election. Well, Ronald Reagan ran on it. He was asked when he announced his presidential run, you all, all have heard the, his famous retort when, well, now that you're running for president, what's your, what is your uh, Cold War strategy? And he said, our, our strategy is very straightforward. Uh, we win and they lose. And, uh, and of course, he was mocked by the, uh, uh, by the, the, the bright and the good and the journalists and uh, academics as a cowboy who had no idea the nuance of, uh, of policy and so forth. So anyway, that's what he ran on. He ran on. He won. And uh, he had, in the meantime, uh, uh, commissioned a, a pretty large group during the campaign to, uh, because he was fairly confident he was going to win, and the polls supported that. And so by the time of the election, he had a fully fleshed out uh, budget uh, for a supplemental and a budget amendment and, uh, and a long-term five-year plan to build the 600-ship Navy and cost it out and with the help of a lot of people in the Pentagon and on Capitol Hill. So uh, during the transition, uh, the president was uh, 
uh, very, uh, uh, very supportive of doing something as early as possible. And he said, what can we do to show that uh, this is a new game in town? This is entirely a real change of direction. It's not just a political uh, platform. It's not just uh, rhetoric. It, it, it's a fundamental change away from the, the passive containment that had been the foundation of NATO deterrence in the Cold War to the adoption of a more forward strategy, including a rollback of the influence of the, uh, of the Soviet Union. And, uh, and how can we do that early on? So we in the Navy said, uh, uh, we've got a deal for you. And uh, that is, we have this exercise every year with all the NATO navies. And, uh, and so instead of staying below the GI-UK gap, and this starts just, you know, in August. This is, uh, at the time, uh, was only uh, about six months away. And he said, um, uh, so if you turn left and go into the Norwegian Sea, then... Um, uh, that would certainly get their attention. And we said, yes, we, we, uh, we can take two, two, uh, Nimitz, or two uh, American supercarriers and uh, uh, some smaller British carriers, helicopter and jump jet uh, carriers, and uh, we can put quite an offensive force up there, and we can operate and exercise it, making it clear that we can attack. We can go all the way north. We can attack into their most vulnerable areas, their strategic assets in the White Sea and the Kola Peninsula, and there's nothing they can do to stop us. And, uh, uh, but, and so the president really liked that, the president-elect. Uh, he said, yeah, that's, uh, let's, let's start planning. I said, well, the planning's done, but there's one caveat. You can't tell the Joint Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> and he said, oh, that's interesting. And we said, yeah, it's certain to leak. You know, there's 6,000 bureaucrats in the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and most of them are far from supportive of a forward strategy. And it's bound to leak, and then you'll have to, they'll say, we've got to study it. And so five years from now, they might issue a, a, a report. And you certainly can't tell NATO. And he said, well, Certainly, it, uh, you know, if, if you bring NATO in on this, uh, uh, it'll leak uh, in, in Europe. And we said, no, um, the Royal Navy, the Dutch Navy, uh, the, they never tell their ministries what they're doing anyway. And the ministries don't care because they, uh, and, and SHAPE doesn't care. They have no idea what, what goes on when the Navy's out there playing in their ships. And uh, so he, he said, yeah, let's do that. And so we did. <clears throat> uh, uh, we turned left instead of going across uh, underneath the GIUK gap Maginot line, went up into the north. And the first they knew that we were up there was when uh, Admiral Lyons, Ace Lyons, who was the second the strike fleet commander, uh, sent a, uh, a flight of four F-14s and four A-6Es and four tankers <clears throat> a thousand miles from the carrier to blow through an exercise that the, the Russians were doing right off, uh, uh, right off Murmansk. And it just blew them away. They had no idea the carriers were in the Norwegian Sea. And how they were kept... Uh, invisible is another interesting issue, but <clears throat> so they sent, they launched everything, every airplane that could fly, all the ships, all the subs, to try to find the carriers in the battle groups. So well, we had 83 ships up there, and uh, it, it was really a, uh, uh, a, a total shock to them. And we proved in that first exercise that we could do it. We could do it, and they couldn't stop us. They couldn't find us for the, for the most part. When they did find us, they had F-14s uh, on both wings. Uh, uh, that uh, there were subs, uh, attack uh, NATO attack subs that were uh, underneath their uh, their major ships. So it was uh, it was a total shock to them. 
Well, that was just the beginning because uh, uh, some months later in January, February, we did the same thing in the North Pacific. We ran attacks, mock attacks against Vladivostok, Petropavlovsk. Uh, we uh, again set a major force up there. It's a nasty place to operate in both the North Atlantic and the North Pacific that time of year. You get willy walls and snow squalls and and storms and the weather's very unpredictable and very difficult to operate. You get ice on the decks, you have to send sailors up the radar mass with hammers to knock the ice off and uh, uh, you get snow on the deck of the carrier and uh, it's, it's very difficult to operate up there. But, and so they didn't believe we were ever gonna be able to do it. And we showed them we could. And we did it every year got better and better, refined the, the, each, each exercise with lessons learned, what worked, what didn't work. And uh, the next year was better and better until finally we realized we could put the carriers, we could hide the carriers completely by putting them in the Norwegian fjords up in the Norwegian sea. And, uh, uh, and we did that. And oh, call the naysayers in the Pentagon by then the Pentagon found out about what we were doing, uh, said uh, you can't operate an air wing in, a, in the confined space of a fjord. You've got 3,000 foot uh, cliffs and mountains on both sides and uh, uh, it, it's a terrible, unpredictable uh, gusts, winds and snow squalls and, and weird currents and so forth. We said we could, we did, Soviets never Found, never got a paint on the carriers in both uh, in, in both 85 and 86 when we were up there. And uh, the result was that finally the, the uh, Soviet general staff uh, said a demarche to the Politburo saying they had to treble the budget for the uh, for the northern fleet and the northern air force or they could not defend uh, the homeland for more than a week. And that hit like a thunderclap. Uh, and, and it was frankly just what Gorbachev was looking for because he uh, wasn't sure he could really take on the military. And he knew he couldn't, they couldn't really sustain what they were already spending because outside of what the Navy was doing, there was Star Wars, which uh, President Reagan was very uh, openly supporting, and uh, uh, there were a lot of other things going on. Of course, their economy was was tanking because they'd have had they had the uh, uh, the, the meltdown of, of the, uh, uh, the the Chernobyl facility, and they uh, had the collapse of the oil price at, uh, right in the middle of that, and they were going bankrupt, and so that gave him the power internally to uh, take on the military and not only say no to their demand for a trebling of the northern uh, expenditures, but uh, he enabled him to impose major cuts and to adopt a, a defensive strategy rather than the offensive strategy that the general staff uh, was uh, advocating. That led uh, to a, a, a coup attempt uh, which failed and uh, which enabled uh, Gorbachev then further uh, to purge the uh, military of those who he did not believe were supporting uh, his uh, perestroika uh, and his initiatives to uh, negotiate with, uh, with the West. So um, uh, it wasn't long before it all began to unravel and, uh, and that finally uh, uh, the collapse came uh, uh, about a, a, a year and a half later. And uh, that was the end of the Cold War as, uh, as Reagan had uh, predicted. And uh, the Navy was a major part of that. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So Seth. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say uh, a little bit more about um, 
the Navy's role uh, in strategic deterrence as far as exercising maritime strategy in the, in the North. Then or now? Then. Then, of course, the nuclear balance uh, was uh, seen by both sides at the beginning of the Reagan administration as relatively stable parity. There were arguments on both sides as to whether there was an imbalance, but essentially it was seen as parity. But gradually, as uh, leaks uh, from uh, people like Ron Pelton and other uh, the Walker spy ring um, at how good uh, the US Navy was at uh, um, trailing and uh, uh, being able to sink, to follow and sink and know where every one of their key strategic subs was at the time, uh, gave them a, a lot of fear because they suddenly realized, thanks to the spies they had in our, uh, in, in, in our system, that um, the, uh, they were so much worse than they thought they were vis-a-vis -vis the US in anti-submarine warfare, that their subs were very noisy and easy to track. And uh, that's when they pulled their boomers, uh, their strategic uh, submarines back under the ice, thinking they'd be safer there. Uh, they weren't safer there. And, uh, and so, that uh, uh, gave them a lot of pause after spending, you know, what we now know is 40 to 45 percent of their GDP to build this force to try to achieve uh, Admiral Gorshkov's dream of uh, naval superiority. Uh, that uh, they were now worse off than than they were before they started the massive buildup, and the United States was flourishing and was seen as uh, uh, handling this very easily, this, uh, this Reagan buildup. So uh, deterrence began to, to, to crack in favor of the West. And then the, the, uh, the forward strategy use, building up and using the buildup of the conventional naval forces, uh, demonstrating to them, proving to them that they could, if they were to launch their superiority in land forces in Central Europe, that we could dominate the seas, cut them off from any resources, and strike deep into the Soviet Union, and they couldn't stop us. Um, keep going. Uh, I want. I uh, I want to save you the trouble during the question period of asking a question or answering a question which I get asked all the time. So I'll ask it because I know that it will be asked anyway. So I'm going to cut off somebody or other here. Um, but you know too much, and uh, someone who might ask it might make it a lot easier for me to answer. <laughs> I doubt it. Uh, the debate over carrier aviation goes back to the beginning of carrier aviation. Uh, and the similar questions are being raised today that were raised, as you know, um, as early as the 1950s, 1940s. Uh, 1917 was the first yeah, British Yes, carrier. yes, at the beginning of Naval War. Yeah. So, uh, and they're raised. Um, uh, Primarily in the um, in the discussions I have in speeches where I, where I speak in front of audiences by uh, Chinese ballistic missile capabilities um, and hypersonic gliding weapons uh, and the whole system which is advertised not proven but advertised uh, to be able to uh, attack successfully a large ship like an aircraft carrier at sea while it's underway at a distance of a thousand miles. So um, 
is naval aviation still relevant uh, as applied against the Chinese, for example, with weapons like that? So I, I can give my own answer, but I'm not here to do that. You are. Uh, well, naval forces have a huge advantage over land-based forces in that they keep moving. And they can use cover and deception. They, a carrier moves at 35 knots in any direction. Uh, it, it, it is uh, uh, certainly uh, vulnerable to attack, as, uh, but not as vulnerable to, uh, uh, for instance, an Air Force or an Army uh, base that is in your iPhone uh, down to the, to the foot and uh, lat long. Uh, it, the, the, the argument against uh, for the vulnerability of the carriers, as I say, goes back to 1917 when the, car when the British put uh, so much resources in their first aircraft carrier. The worst period we had in the vulnerability of aircraft carriers was <coughs> really in Okinawa, where they couldn't really take advantage of their mobility. They had to stay close, uh, close to Karamaretto and uh, uh, Ulithi and so forth. Uh, it it uh, uh, the, the the greatest threat, even greater than what the Chinese can put together today was the kamikazes, because they could come in massed uh, from all azimuths. Uh, they, uh, they developed very effective tactics, sea skimming 20 feet above the sea, then popping up and diving right into the attacks. We lost 35 destroyers at Okinawa, the kamikazes. We were under attack for 100 days. We never lost a carrier in terms of it being sunk. We uh, had four of them put out of action, uh, but we had more than 20 there of, of substantial sized carriers. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so the, the, the guidance systems in the kamikazes were really better uh, in most ways and more of a threat than what the current uh, Soviet and uh, Chinese uh, uh, levels are yes. Uh, they say they have a hypersonic missile. Uh, we know where they are in the development of it. It's not yet a threat. We've been worried about you know we, the Soviets had a maneuvering ICB or uh, ballistic missile uh, warhead uh, targeted on the carriers. So uh, there is no invulnerable system. But you, you should look at the carriers as a movable piece of, uh, of, of NATO real estate that can carry a broad range of, of weapon systems, um, uh, 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 unmanned UAVs, attack UAVs, uh, uh, and uh, uh, special forces units, as you recall, uh, when uh, after 9-11, uh, we had no uh, bases close enough uh, to attack Afghanistan. And so we, we sent the Kitty Hawk with the Army Rangers and the SEALs and all the special forces who were the first ones inserted to, to, uh, to attack. Uh, the Kitty Hawk was, uh, 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 was the main base for the first six months, really, of the the war because all the land bases were out of range for tactical uh, uh, tactical maneuver. So, uh, and similarly, back <clears throat> back in the Reagan years, the in, in Haiti, uh, when we sent two divisions down to stabilize the situation, in Haiti we had no bases close enough to <clears throat> get their aviation and their cavalry and so forth there. So, we cleared the decks on the Kennedy took all the air wing off and put on the two uh, airborne divisions and all their helicopters and uh, support. So uh, it, it, there's nothing new in the debate about vulnerability except for those who don't know their history. Uh, the uh, offense defense balance is still going on. Uh, advantages come and then are neutralized and uh, uh, it's, uh, 
the, 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 the advantage of the large carrier and why small carriers are, I'm, I'm much less sanguine about the putting marine uh, F-35s on, on LHDs uh, because they don't have the compartmentalization, they don't have the armor, they don't have the triple uh, armored decks. Uh, they're very vulnerable ships. And uh, uh, if you look at a Nimitz class carrier, there's a three HY-80 uh, armored decks that run through the entire ship, triple hull, seven layers, uh, uh, more than seven feet thick around all the sides of multi-layered kinds of material to absorb a shape charge warhead. So the sea skimming uh, shape charge a warhead that the Soviets uh, was, was the biggest threat we had, uh, or an exoset, a little smaller, uh, they wouldn't even notice. It couldn't penetrate uh, through the side uh, side protections. Uh, and uh, it's got a thousand, a thousand watertight compartments. So where it is hit and damaged, that's automatically contained. So a smaller ship, like a 45,000 ton uh, F-35 carrier doesn't have any of that. And as we saw with the Atlantic conveyor and the Falklands, uh, one lucky exocet uh, put the entire supply of Chinook, uh, the entire supply of Chinooks on the bottom. So that yeah, yeah I think so. I, I, let me just ask one other question and then um, open the, the floor here for questions. Um, what lessons, or what is the lesson from the maritime strategy when you were secretary that applies today, especially vis-a-vis -vis China? Yeah, uh, the lesson is you, we, you have to uh, deter. You have to uh, make the potential opponent understand by demonstrating, not just by writing strategy, but, but getting out there and operating and showing, proving that you can make uh, them uh, uh, lose more by attempting to use their power than they could possibly gain. And uh, that is where we have created the, uh, uh, the instability today, by, uh, by disarming unilaterally to the point where, uh, and the, the Chinese have been quite frank about it. Uh, as you know, uh, you've been there, I've been there a couple of times meeting with their uh, general staff people and intelligence people after, after the Cold War. And you know they're very sophisticated people. Uh, the ones that uh, I tended to uh, uh, deal with were, you know, Stanford, Caltech graduates, uh, beautiful Italian suits, and uh, flawless English, and uh, and very very intelligent. And uh, and basically they were very frank. They said, "You why have you you know you've abandoned the Pacific? You have pulled back. We never see carriers out here anymore." You have uh, cut your force by 40%, and there's no indication you're going to uh, uh, stop uh, disarming. And we are utterly dependent on the seas. We are utterly dependent for 85% of all of our resources on the Sunda Straits, the Malacca Straits, all of the vulnerable areas in the Pacific Rim. And so it, it, we have no, we, we don't believe that you're. Your, there's any intent to rebuild, so we're going to have to build a 600 ship navy. They were very frank about it. We're going to build a 600 ship navy because you've abandoned it, and we have to control the Western Pacific if you're not going to. And that's what they've done. Now, they're obviously the appetite grows with the eating, and uh, uh, certainly there there are questions about how much you know whether Mr. Xi controls the military or they control him, uh, which is an interesting question, but uh, certainly there are people within their, uh, their military that, have, that harbor more aggressive uh, uh, views of the United States. 
But uh, so what, what we have to do is what we did back in, in the 80s. We have to prove to them that they cannot defeat us at, at sea and that if they try to use their growing naval power to interfere with our alliances and our commerce, uh, that they will pay much too high a price. Today, we do not have a large enough force uh, or a modernized enough force to, uh, to make these intelligent uh, uh, planners believe that uh, they could not defeat us if, uh, if that's what their national interest uh, 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 demanded in their eyes. So that's what we've got to restore, just as we did in the 80s. We've got to make it clear to the Russians, uh, to the North Koreans, to the Chinese and to the Iranians that uh, we, we can really defeat them if they, uh, and make, make the cost prohibitive if they try to use the military uh, capabilities that they have built up in the belief that uh, the US is gonna continue to uh, withdraw and disarm. That's fine, let me, uh, we'll go on afterwards, but let, let me open the floor up here. There's a question in the back, sir. If you just wait for the microphone, and if you could also uh, identify yourself, that would be helpful. My name is uh, Don Kirk. I've spent some time in West, in the Pacific uh, as a journalist. Uh, you know, I, these carriers keep on wandering around there out of Yokosuka, and they challenge the Chinese in the South China Sea the Chinese only have a couple of carriers. Uh, how good are they? Uh, I just wonder whether there's some uh, argument against this pessimistic view that you're presenting. Are we really that weak when we have these carriers at Yokosuka, when, when we do challenge them in the South China Sea, when their carriers are really untested and probably not very, possibly not very good? Well, uh, first of all, we only have one carrier in Yokosuka. We've never had more than one carrier, and that unfortunately is overtasked in going out to the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. True, uh, they haven't gone through the South China Sea uh, lately, although we have sent destroyers and uh, cruisers, uh, not in mass, but in single uh, uh, single sorties. The carriers are, uh, we really only have nine deployable carriers and we have obligations to, because the uh, combatant commanders uh, really call the shots and uh, 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 sink sent uh, the uh, uh, command, combatant commander in, in the central uh, theater demands two carriers on station, one in the Arabian Sea and one in the Persian Gulf. So right there, it takes, to keep two always on station, it takes six carriers. So that's six out of the nine. You have the one carrier in Yokosuka to cover the entire Pacific. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, now uh, the uh, shape headquarters requires that we keep a carrier available in the med. Uh, for long years, we, we had no carrier, no more carriers after the end of the Cold War. So the demands from the COCOMs are higher than we have ships to, to meet them. And it's one of the reasons why we have been having all the problems with collisions and with uh, 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 breakdowns and so forth, because to uh, terribly mix a metaphor, we are running these ships into the ground because we have uh, uh, too, uh, too many uh, powerful uh, combatant commanders who demand and undergo water nickels. They, they have the right to force the Navy to disgorge its ships. And uh, there are eight of them, and they're all demanding naval uh, ships, and there aren't enough to go around. We are uh, in, in, since uh, a year ago, we have built up the fleet from the 270 and declining that they inherited. Uh, we're now up to uh, 286 as of today and growing. We will reach the 355 uh, given the consensus in Congress 
and the administration that we have to build enough ships to, to prevent the, coll the collapse of readiness that's been going on in our fleet uh, today. It's true, I, we have, if we were to swing uh, the force to the Pacific and abandon other, these other areas, we could cream the Chinese Navy without question. And their carriers so far are, they're, they're not serious attack carriers. Uh, they, the Liaoning is, is a 30 some year old uh, Russian uh, uh, rehab and, uh, and they have no catapults. But they are, they have announced and are, uh, have the plans to build a supercarrier uh, of the size of the, the new Ford class. So uh, they're, they're yeah, thinking long terms. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah, sure. Oh, you got my support. Okay. Um, I'm Mitzi Worth. I'm with the Naval Postgraduate School. I also want to thank you for giving me my door sign when I left the Navy. <laughs> um, how does the whole computer world affect the Navy now? Well, it's a very good question because you know there's a, it's a cliche now that the real threat is the cyber threat. The Chinese are really the leading uh, purveyors of the, the cyber threat. We, the Navy, have gone very far in uh, 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 network-based warfare, netting the entire force spread all around. That brings vulnerabilities. It brings real capabilities. And if done right and effectively uh, provides a very robust uh, command and control and uh, uh, intelligence uh, uh, environment, but it also has its vulnerabilities. And there, there is no uh, digital world that is not attackable. And the Chinese are the number one uh, purveyors, and uh, along with the Iranians and the North uh, Koreans and the uh, and the Russians. So it's it, it is a very very serious. Uh, area, it's the top threat I think everybody recognizes. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Um, first of all, congratulations. In the 80s, I was uh, advisor to the cabinet of President Mitterrand. And um, I, in 84, 85, in a few meetings, uh, your doctrine, yourself, uh, have been very respected. I don't know how public it was, but uh, very respected. And I'm not in military sector, so even though, so congratulations, very impressive, and the whole Europe did appreciate, not necessarily very openly. Uh, I have a question. In addition to carriers, today uh, the Belt and the Road Initiative of China, specifically the case of Piraeus, Piraeus uh, Harbor in Greece, and this will continue. How would you integrate this harbor aspect? Uh, and in your thinking, what doctrine would you have for it? Thank you. Uh, I don't really, I don't view the, um, uh, the Belt and Road uh, as, as a particularly uh, uh, military relevant uh, uh, initiative. <clears throat> you know, the, uh, in World War II, before World War II, the Germans had very similar uh, investments and hence access uh, to American ports all over the country. That lasted about uh, one day past uh, Hitler's declaration of war. Uh, so, but in, in a non-conflict situation, it does give great advantages for access, for intelligence gathering, for um, uh, f for uh, it, it has great military utility. Uh, it largely disappears very quickly uh, if if fighting breaks out. But it is something we have to keep a very clear eye on because they're using that access. Military naval ships, Chinese naval ships, are visiting uh, places like Djibouti, which is becoming more of a base than 
uh, than just uh, a Belt and Road access. I, I would say that today, uh, shifting back to your original point, and uh, uh, you're welcome to keep talking in that vein, <laughs> um, uh, they, the French Navy today is, is far and away the best Navy in Europe. Uh, they have really eclipsed the Royal Navy. Uh, they are professional. They, uh, they, are, uh, they have been modernized enough to really be integrated in American battle groups. And there are very few of the European navies that have, have kept up to that standard. I mean, even the Royal Navy has cut way too much. Um, and uh, so hopefully the French uh, lesson, and they're spending more than the 2% that, uh, that they're, they're pledged to. So, uh, uh, and, and I think that uh, their voice in strategy as a result uh, is, is pretty uh, influential. In the back, yeah, right there, yes. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could speculate a bit about what strategy you would take in the South China Sea, not in a direct confrontation, but when the Chinese Navy begins to whittle away at the access uh, and um, territorial claims of a whole variety of Southeast Asian countries, boards, fishing vessels, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it seems unlikely that you'd want to have a huge confrontation between the United States and China over a fishing vessel. So how, how would you, what, what mechanisms would you use, what strategy would you use to deter that kind of sort of mosquito-like um, affront, if you want to? Uh, yeah. You understand first, my question? First of all, no, that's a good question. And, and uh, uh, I, I, uh, I, I believe too many uh, commentators focus on the bilateral balance between the Chinese forces and the American forces. Uh, we have quite a broad and effective alliance system in, in the Pacific Rim, uh, starting with the world's largest aircraft carrier uh, offshore of, of China called Japan. And uh, Japan is very focused on the Chinese potential to interfere with, uh, with uh, their vital interests. We, of course, uh, should not go to war because they are violating international law uh, in, in uh, arming these uh, uh, Carl Atolls, and uh, they have like 17 of them. Uh, at this date. We continue not to recognize that, not just us. Japan just sent uh, a couple of uh, Aegis uh, destroyers and a, an oiler right through the middle of their, uh, their claimed zone. Uh, and uh, uh, our alliance, our friendship and cooperation and uh, exercising with the Vietnamese Navy, uh, which is not in the same class as Japan by any means, but they are no friends of China. They're very concerned, and they're growing more, uh, more and more close uh, in doctrine and uh, and in uh, uh, navy to navy cooperation. So we have a good alliance system that we've let uh, let fray a, a bit in the last uh, twenty years. That we're now in the process of of restoring, particularly through. Uh, uh, military to military uh, uh, activity. Uh, I uh, I don't think we ever should recognize or uh, observe what the Chinese are demanding in the South and East China Seas. We should continue to send combatants through exercising their rights of innocent passage and. Uh, uh, and not observe any 12-mile uh, limits from these atolls. Uh, but it will not come to a conflict as long as we rebuild, along with our allies out there, a force that could make it very clear that they would suffer more than they could possibly hope to gain if they were to use force against a Japanese fishing boat or 
interfere with, because this is a very busy sea lane through the South China Sea. And they've declared an air defense intercept zone, and it is, and we don't observe it, and we're not, I hope, ever going to observe it. So I, I think we've got to just make it clear by restoring deterrence, by building up with our allies a fleet that is able to, to make clear that they cannot uh, uh, get away with that kind of thing. If um, the, the only reason why China has become such a um, threat has been because its rate of economic growth has been so fast over the last 40 years, and even though its, its defense expenditure as a share of GDP is not large, uh, every year it grows very rapidly because of this fast economic growth, which is, has been systemically much faster than that of the U.S. So. W would it be logical to say that part of the defense policy of the U.S. should be to try to accelerate as much as possible the rate of economic growth of the U.S. so that with the same defense expenditure as a share of GDP, the U.S. could produce more weapons, more, more destroyers and, and, and aircraft carriers and submarines? Well, there's no question that uh, economic power is the basis of, of military power. Uh, and uh, but we are not a command economy like uh, like the Chinese. We can't just say, okay, we're going to grow the uh, we're going to double the rate of growth in the in the GDP. As you know, the policies that uh, that are being pursued right now have uh, eliminated unemployment and uh, uh, have uh, what seems to be. Uh, uh, between a three and four and maybe higher growth rate for the first time in 15 years or so. So I think we're doing pretty well as could be expected. I think the very, the, the, the very success of the Chinese adoption of, of this uh, kind of statist capitalism uh, is bringing about the problems that will force them more and more to the kind of uh, centralized uh, planning uh, that brought down the Soviet Union. Uh, if you try to run a, as diverse and as immense an economy uh, it, as China and the population as diverse and different culturally as, uh, as the Chinese are, if you try to run it all from Beijing, as we see there very predictably now taking, trying to take away the authority of, uh, of the provinces to borrow money, of cities to borrow money, they're centralizing more and more. And with centralization comes uh, a lack of agility and has, uh, you know, it, it's, the, it's the central weakness of uh, all socialist-based uh, economics. And they've been, their growth has been largely because they've allowed a hundred flowers to grow uh, and uh, not interfered with, uh, with the local control over uh, an investment, but now they're having to. So um, I, I, I'm optimistic, frankly. Uh, I think the balance will, uh, uh, will settle into a stable balance if, uh, uh, if uh, if we do the right things, and uh, the Chinese are are not inherently warlike culturally, they they've got a lot of issues uh, that they uh, they want to deal with. Uh, I don't think they plan to annex uh, California, although I I'd negotiate about that. But uh, uh, so uh, it's. Uh, uh, it, it, I think there is real cause for optimism because we don't have to try to. We don't have to have the kind of the size buildup we had in the Reagan years just to restore uh, the, the, the kind of uh, deterrence and stability globally that, uh, that, that we need. We got a lot of friends around the world. Still. Yes. Go ahead. I can hear your question, so it saves time if you. I'm an intel analyst and a former diplomat. Um, my big concern is that uh, not, not the whole plating on the aircraft carriers. But that um, China is very close to the capability of a stealthy drone coming in and dropping a tactical nuke 
over the aircraft carrier with 5,000 dead sailors. So that's, even if there's a 2% chance of that, that just, that just seems too much to me. And, and for the next $14 billion aircraft carrier, we could buy seven missile-laden destroyers or seven submarines or 28 frigates or 100 joint high-speed uh, vessels. That seems like a lot of naval firepower to give up for another carrier. Well, first, uh, the carriers are, are, the Ford is the lead ship of the class. It, uh, it was totally screwed up by the reforms that were foisted on the Pentagon and the Navy uh, uh, back, uh, uh, back when the uh, Zumwalt and the LCS and the Ford were conceived. And so uh, the, there is this, this view in many sectors that have no operational experience and no naval experience and many of these analysts think that ships are solid like their old toy boats uh, but uh, uh, there is uh, there was a, 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 a the, with the Goldwater nickel reform that we moved from line accountability in running procurement and uh, maintenance and so forth to uh, design and procurement by committees uh, and so now we have the we have more than 40 joint requirements committees uh, uh, headed supposedly by the JROC in which every system has to be joint it's got to go through the joint process so that army majors get to say well I think the LCS should go 45 knots not just 40 and uh, it, it has put in a total lack of accountability uh, the, the, the last Nimitz class uh, carrier in today's dollars delivered for about $6 billion. And the Ford uh, had 12 new unproved technologies, the electric catapult, the electric arresting gear, the electric drive, the, the distributed data bus. The, uh, it, it's it was crazy, crazy. And it was done uh, by a joint bureaucracy that said the Navy would still be in sale if we didn't uh, force them to adopt new technologies. And the same with, uh, with the, uh, uh, the Zumwalt. It's, it, it is a camel of a ship designed by 40 different joint requirements committees. Nobody in charge. You can't fire anybody. And so we don't, we're not running the Navy that way today in violation of all sorts of defense acquisition regulations. There's, by the way, 141 feet of regulations on the shelf of defense acquisition regulations. And you, you can't possibly build anything if you follow all of the bureaucratic uh, rules. So uh, the carriers are the ones that support everything else. Yes, a nuclear, uh, a nuclear weapon uh, is going to take out and vaporize a carrier. It wouldn't vaporize it, but it would certainly uh, make it pretty unusable. Uh, and it would kill probably all the people aboard. Uh, but that, think of what that same warhead could do uh, to Washington or to Fort Bragg or to, uh, uh, to, to the Air Force Base at Hickam Field or to Guam or, so everything's vulnerable to the nuclear war. Uh, but nobody believes, and there's no evidence that any Chinese believe, that there's any fire break where they could start uh, nuking uh, naval ships and not have it spread anywhere else. So it's, it's kind of a, a red herring. Your point, the valid point is, if we have to keep paying 14 billion for a 6 billion carrier, uh, then we ought to stop building them. And we should build smaller 70,000 ton carriers that can be competed, get competition back into it. But we can't do without ca survivable carriers because the carrier brings along a 500 mile across disk of air superiority. 
and nothing can, can live on the surface of the sea without air superiority over it. And it, it, you can't get it from land bases. There are no land bases over most, uh, within range of most of the world's sea lanes. So uh, you're stuck with providing air superiority. And whether you do it by bringing in more uh, unmanned aircraft, uh, like the new Navy uh, carrier tanker that is uh, uh, unmanned, uh, or how you do it, it doesn't matter. You've got to have a base that can launch, can arm, launch, maintain, and uh, uh, move. And that, my judgment, is a minimum of 70,000 tons. And just to add a point about the accountability question, in the, toward the, the end of the construction process for the construction of the Ford, uh, the previous Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Greener, was asked by John McCain, who is responsible for the cost overruns? And Greener said, I can't tell you. Yeah. Well, I could. Uh, well, but I, the list I, is, uh, is about 3,000 people because it's, it was built by committee. Well, Greener elaborated. But <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know the point you're making. But... But uh, that's the system we have today. And that is why when I left uh, at the height of the Reagan buildup, uh, we had uh, 594 ships. We had 20 Army divisions. We had 35 tactical fighter wings and all the ancillary support and weapon systems that go with them. And we had 450,000 civilian FTEs in the Department of Defense, which seemed to me to be an insanely crazy number. Um, and uh, uh, today we have eight Army divisions, 17 tactical fighter wings, uh, 285 ships, but 960,000 civilians in the Department of Defense. Bureaucracy grows. And as the bureaucracy grows, it slows everything down and you get more and more Nimitz, or not Nimitz, but uh, Ford class carriers and, uh, and so forth. So yes. we have time for one more question and then we'll. Okay, who gets the, you already had one. Oh, okay, all right, you can. Your excellent presentation, George Nicholson from the Global Special Operations Foundation. Thanks for your reference to Haiti. I was on board the America down there. We had the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment on board with Lieutenant Colonel Doug Brown, who ended up as a four-star, and the other carrier was the Eisenhower, which we had the 10th Mountain Division. Huh. About a, uh, a year ago at the Atlantic Council, General Neller, the Commandant of the Marine Corps, said his biggest concern, biggest threats to the Marines in the future is our dependence upon GPS and SATCOM. And he talked about a month before that he had been in Afghanistan driving around with some of his Marines. And he said, show me on the map. And they looked at me, he said, they looked at me like I was a dinosaur. I said, sir, we don't need maps anymore. I've got my cell phone and I've got my tablet. A, a, a week later, I was at the Simpson Center with Admiral Richardson and mentioned that. And he said, you've been reading my emails. He said, I asked the same question. And uh, I said, can we go back to using sextants? And they said, sir, that's an anachronism. We don't use sextants anymore. We, uh, uh, so they've reinstituted that. But I've asked the Air Force the question is, well, they don't really understand. We'll always be able to provide this, this capability. And the last thing you talked about during Vietnam, my two tours over there, I guess the A-6 had about a 1,500-mile combat radius. During Desert Storm, my friend Riley Mixon had his four carriers in the Red Sea, took two aerial refuelings to get up overhead uh, Iraq, two aerial refuelings to get back. I mentioned that to Frank Pandolf, who recently retired, and he laughed and says, when I was had my carrier off the coast of Pakistan operating in Afghanistan, it took five aerial refuelings. Uh, how's that problem going to be solved? Well, uh, there is a serious problem. In, in, again, the Navy was forced against its will uh, to adopt uh, the whole air wing uh, to F-18s. Uh, now, I'm a little prejudiced because I flew A-6s. And our motto, as you know, was we go deeper, stay longer, and deliver a bigger load. And uh, the F-18 has about a third the range and payload of the A-6s. There are no more A-6s. Uh, 
uh, the uh, in the Bush administration, the the uh, A6F was killed, the A12 was killed, all of the Navy long-range aircraft were were killed because the wisdom was that the Air Force can do all that. Well, we found that that's not the case. I mean, my son flew uh, uh, Prowlers uh, off uh, on three tours on the the Teddy Roosevelt, and he had to refuel six times on the way in and loitering for uh, uh, to be called down, and uh, five times to get back. It was just crazy, uh, but that's, uh, that's our new joint system. Everything is joint. Um, thank you very much, um, pleasure, and uh, thank you for your attention and good questions and uh, stay tuned. There will be more in this series. Um, good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you.